Welcome back to Bizarre Podcast, Dogs Must Die. My name is Grant. You can call him Chip. And today we are continuing on with JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, Golden Wind, episodes 27 through 29. We're really only starting, you know, the last third of the show here, but for some reason, like from this episode on, it just constantly feels to me like, right, we're just about to hit the end. <laughs> I think it's just because the last third doesn't let up. Yeah, I, I definitely get get that sense that like basically these three episodes cover the four parts, essentially the four moods of JoJo, which is like <laughs> fight, tension, information, fight again. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> uh, but, but but before we start, I just wanted to say that this is the first recording we're doing after the uh, uh, unfortunate and untimely death of Billy Kamitz, yes. the English voice actor for Joseph Kay, uh, who uh, honestly we could not like praise his performance enough. Mm-hmm. So I just wanted to give a little bit of a tribute here to a, a very talented uh, uh, young man who did not have very long career especially if you only count like his named characters joseph k is one of his first certainly mm-hmm. his first lead role and that was very recent yeah uh, uh, all told and uh ever since that news broke a little while ago you know just thinking about even with you know the the short time his career lasted as you know a person who you would recognize at least just how much incredible work he did and yeah. thoughts with the people who knew him as a person and not just a, a talent, a credit. Uh, oh yeah. I recognize that guy. Yeah. Yeah. I was, that was super shocking to see for sure. Cause it's like, he was what? 35 really young. Yeah. Yeah. Really young, yeah. but probably the best performance of a main Jojo so far. He had like the exact energy for, for Joe's guy. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, I don't know how to segue into this into a man <laughs> bleeding from his throat and talking to a frog. <laughs> I did kind of set us up to fail. Yeah. But yes, that is the opening scene <laughs> of <the> episode. <laughs> this fucking show. It can't let you be. You can't be serious. You can't no. even try. No. Uh, episode of Antisete. King Crimson versus Metallica. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> Even just the episode title itself, just, just King Crimson yeah, versus Metallica, yeah, it, it's very funny. It sounds like the name of a forum thread I never <laughs> want to read. <laughs> yeah. You can't make me. <laughs> Some really ill-advised show in the mid-2000s on VH1 or something. I don't know. <laughs> so yeah, we catch up with our fight previously in progress. <laughs> Listen back to, to the episode two weeks ago, the last you know, 10, 15 minutes or so. Uh, uh, and hear all about Dopio the sweet boy mm. uh, getting getting all fucked up. Uh, and he's on the phone with, the, with the, the frog phone with the boss who's like, hey, hey, buddy, don't worry. I got you. Did you forget that I gave you King Crimson's arms? <laughs> yes. And also something called epitaph, which is not in clear bullet points, at least explained in dialogue. Yeah. Mu- so, so think of it like Bites the Dust or something. It's mm-hmm. a second ability with a second name that uh, uh, King Crimson has. Named, of course, for that one song off of uh, uh, In the Hall of the Crimson King. Yeah. It is the forehead face. It's, it's the angry forehead face. And it's that, the angry forehead face. That, <laughs> and that is the part of King Crimson that allows him to see the future. Yeah. It, it is important that Dopio does not have the part of King Crimson that allows him to uh, obliterate time and be the only cause in a universe of effects. Yeah, yeah. But he can see the future, which is, it's not nothing. It's pretty good. Oh, yeah. By the way, Epitaph is localized to eulogy. Uh, 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 I mean, it's definitely on on a theme. Or we're, we're keeping the uh, uh, syllable count, the initial. I get it. I get it. Yeah. But the way this manifests for Dopio is not like the world as red tint acting before it acts. Mm-hmm. No, his hair swoopy, his Kakuin style hair swoopy. <laughs> Becomes a projector screen yes. on which he sees the future from behind. It's a it's a rad visual. I love it. <laughs> he has an AR visor like a uh, heads up display of the future <laughs> on his, his hair. hair. The backside of his bangs. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> so that, br- that brings the OP. And on the other side of that, Epitaph shows Risotto coming and then blending into the rocks. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, like a, a stealth camo thing going on here. This whole fight is uh, kind of exactly what I was talking about last week with the the sort of double act, but in one body. Mm. Uh, uh, the boss and Dopio are going to be bickering at some points and coaching one another in others and how best to approach the situation. So now it's the boss's turn to provide advice on how to use this ability. Uh, quote, you've seen the inevitable. Now you must prepare for it. <laughs> yes. The boss and Boingo should have a chat. I think they could really work out the finer points of fate and what it is and how it works oh, God. from like a totally different like uh, uh, point of view than anyone else. Imagine trying to write a fight with those two powers going against each other. <laughs> <laughs> But the specific future that Dopio has seen, the, the specific inevitability, is scissors coming out of his throat. Yeah, uh, the previous episode, the first part of this fight, was already pretty gruesome with Dopio just puking up razor blades. Mm -hmm. uh, but this episode gets even worse because, yeah. 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 <laughs> this is maybe the most violent this JoJo is fight. so disturbing. Yeah. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I want to get real <laughs> with the people at home about uh -huh. things personal to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, what, one thing you might not know, because frankly, it doesn't come up much. I honestly have a fear of needles. I do not like needles yeah. at all. And I think it and some other things that kind of skeeve me out come from like an idea that there is things that are inside the body and things that are outside the body. And transgressing that line mm. is is like a fundamental fear of mine through which individual things like, say, needles comes from. Sure, yeah. This fight sucks for me. It sucks so <laughs> oh, bad. Oh, God, yeah. It, that's all this... <laughs> That everything on the receiving end for Dopio is just that. It's outside things being inside things, and then they have he has to get them out again. <laughs> yeah, it's bad. Ooh, so yeah, he's uh seeing in his hair projector that there's gonna be scissors <laughs> bursting out of his fucking throat, and these aren't like. Little scissors. This is a full at full size pair of scissors. Yeah, these are like the the shears that your teacher would have at her desk and, and wouldn't let you borrow. Yeah, uh, the, the the like all steel scissors that don't have a grip, just like the handles are painted yes. black to make you think they do. Yep. So obviously, when Dopio sees that imagery, he backs the fuck up <laughs> uh, and immediately starts sweating bullets. And the boss through the frog phone is just saying, "You're just gonna have to deal with that." <laughs> There is no denying scissors will sprout from your throat. <laughs> yeah. What a thing to say. So, so yeah, Dopio's like, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll nut up for this. And he <laughs> rushes ahead and punches powerful King Crimson arm punch to the wrong rock. The rock that Risotto is not active camoed behind. Yeah. Yeah, whenever he does these big sand punches, it's just the floating disembodied arms of King Crimson kind of, like, attached to the back of his shoulders. Like, he has a second pair of arms, basically. Yeah, he, he's, a, he's a Machamp, is what he is. Yeah, he's a Machamp with King Crimson arms. He's a shiny Machamp, clearly. <laughs> yes, yeah. So, yeah, he misses, and Risotto, still invisible, is just saying, like, wow, that's the closest anyone's ever gotten to punching me. Anyways, uh, there's scissors in your throat now. And there are. Uh, and Dopio's skin is even tighter than Mista's uh, uh, sweater because, boy, you can see every uh, uh, bit of these scissors and the skin wrinkling around them mm -hmm. like fucking saran wrap. And he reach he re he reaches into his own he reaches into his own throat. Mm -hmm. uh, and pulls the scissors out like he's like using a needle or a pin or something to get at an ingrown hair. Yes. And and he pulls them out. He pulls out the scissors from his throat. Uh, <laughs> I don't. So for the rest of the fight, he's bleeding from his throat, but all the skin is still there. I'm Thank glad it's. I'm God. glad it's there, but. <laughs> And Risotto is impressed. He is cautious of any man who can anticipate throat scissors. <laughs> yeah. You know what? Fair! Fair! Mm -hmm. So Dopio goes in for another punch rush, completely whiffs it because Risotto is already, like, you know, slinked off somewhere else in stealth mode. Invisibly, yeah. Yeah. And so Dopio's feeling not good already. <laughs> he t He's, um understandably having a hard time moving <laughs> from where he currently is. And then he gets another vision of the future, which is his whole foot getting cut off. His vision is of himself like 
crouching and a disembodied foot just sailing away uh, in slow motion in front of his eyes, in front of his present eyes. Mm -hmm. Uh, So he's got to grab that frog again for for counsel. (laughs) (laughs) And yeah, he's relaying all this to the boss and the boss is saying, okay, I told you to nut up for the throat scissors, but losing your foot is is too much. <laughs> do, do something so your foot doesn't come off. And, but Dopio, Dopio is dedicated. Dopio's got what it takes, you know, mm. uh, uh, even though the boss doesn't have a lot of hope considering the position. But he hangs up to the frog because he's got his own plan. Th- this is one of those times where actually I should sit still and wait to get totally fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If he stands still, he can better calculate where and how Risotto is attacking. He's got to conserve his energy. He doesn't want to get fatigued on top of everything else. Gosh. Yeah. And I do like right here and in, in, in a later moment in the fight, too, I believe. There are times where the boss is telling Dopio to do something and Dopio just goes, no, like <laughs> the, the boss can only have like suggest things to the body he inhabits right now. Like he he's a loyal soldier. He will like he will complete his mission, but like the nitty gritty, the the moment to moment details of how that's his business. He's got his own ideas. He's got his own plans. Yeah, and so what Dopio does to try and figure out how these attacks are working and where they're coming from is he just takes the frog phone and just gently places it several inches in front of him on the ground. And then there's just a couple seconds where you're just looking at this frog, like just a still frame, and then it explodes full of razor blades. <laughs> this frog just blows the hell out. up. Uh, uh, the, perhaps, perhaps the frog, the noble frog, is indeed the dog of amphibians. <laughs> Maybe. That's why they rhyme. Yeah. Just imagining if Baron Zeppeli was here for this, he would be so upset to see that frog exploding. So in the briefest briefest possible moment as soon as this frog explodes uh ending its life of mischief <laughs> uh uh dopio flings the scissors like a fucking xeno warrior princess chakram yes and slices risotto's foot off which sails in front of his face uh, uh completing the prophecy again very boingo like yeah yep Bio risotto is shocked that anyone could find him let alone sever his foot off two Ah shit! My foot fell off. And three, uh, <laughs> having your foot cut off makes it, uh, made his foot getting cut off uh, causes him to drop his stealth, and he he's visible just laying on the ground now. Which gives Dopio time to explain just how the razor stand works. Yes, uh, it's like a sphere of influence around <laughs> <laughs> around Risotto. He he has power to manipulate iron mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and can suck out iron from the human body as well so any iron he uses he can transform into anything else that is made out of iron hence so he's basically just turning dopio's blood into razor blades or turning the iron in his blood into scissors but yeah it's it's only a radius which is why when he was approaching the frog blew up first <laughs> luckily he put the frog on you know the risotto side that, yeah. that was just by chance yeah so now that the frog is dead Dopio recognizes it as a dead frog. That is not a phone. What a yeah. ridiculous idea. Where did my phone go? This is a dead frog. But the phone is ringing, so it must be around here somewhere. So he goes back to this little uh, a nest of rocks wherein I believe he found this frog previously. And he reaches inside and he finds uh, some trash cigarettes that someone mm-hmm. just that just wound up here. Some beach litterers. And he's like, wow. They make phones so small these days and starts <laughs> talking into the cigarette that he holds to his ear. Yeah. And so, yeah, the boss is congratulating him over the cigarette phone. And Dopio is asking, should I kill this dude or should I wait you to get wait for you to get here? And so, yeah, they talk it, about it like this several times in this episode where even though they're inhabiting the same body, it takes time for the boss to manifest as if he's traveling to the location. I don't think Dopio knows they share a body. Yeah, yeah. That's the sense I get. I mean, maybe I'll be proven wrong. There's a lot of JoJo's left. I would love to see a scene where he finds out. Yes. That would be amazing. Yeah. <laughs> but but essentially, the plan is reiterated. The boss is, quote, on his way. It will take some time. Uh, he will d- deliver the final blow, but it is Dopio's job to, to get within that two meter uh, uh, deadly, you can't escape me, uh, uh, range. Mm-hmm. So that is when, that's when the severed foot floats by. (laughs) 
and there's little goo boys in the floating ankle. Yep. And sometimes my notes read like a Dada ma- uh, a Dadaist manifesto, <laughs> and I don't know what to do with that fact. I just wanted to say it. But yeah, there's little goo boys in the floating ankle. Yep. Um. Sure. <laughs> so yes. The, sure. The the little goo boys are the stand, Metallica. Yeah. They, they they look like weird little forest spirits made yeah, of mercury. Yeah, Risotto's stand like lives inside his body, like the size of kidney beans. Little little goo boys. Yep. There's a whole bunch of them in that ankle, and so now it is Risotto's turn to read Dopio's ability. Like th- this is how we sell that they are both very you know clever and capable combatants. We learn about their stands as you know viewers from the characters, but not themselves. Mm-hmm. One another. Yeah. And so, yeah, Risotto is pasting together the fact that Dopio can, like, predict the future or, or see into the future. And this is when his floating foot, full of goo boys, uh, shunks back onto his leg and he uses some of his own blood to turn them into giant surgical staples that reattaches his foot. I've said before that I'm impressed about how many of the X-Men use their powers to, to manipulate uh, some sort of flight and to be in Passiona, you have to figure out a way to use your stand to to solve like dismemberment. Yep, that's that's part. That's there. the second part. That's Pulpo's second lighter. Yeah, there there is so much dismemberment in part five. God damn! Like even, <laughs> even later parts, I don't think have that this level of dismemberment. So Risotto has also figured out that once again, there's two boys in this boy. Like he, he, he moves in two different ways. Like we've we've seen him start to bulk up and become like a half boss size. Like wow. At one point he says, "quote It's like there are two of you," mm-hmm. and so he knows. He just knows that this guy who is so close to the boss must be the one who killed his teammates from two years ago. Yeah. And so he's got to find out everything he can about Dopio, just like for the revenge to be all the sweeter. This is when we get like the the mid episode title card mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. featuring Metallica, and then when we're back from that, uh, we're it's flashback time. It's it's time to see more of the entire uh, assassin team. It's not a very deep flashback, like uh, uh, as stated. This is less than a week ago, yep. I guess. <laughs> yes. All of the the entire execution team, uh, like uh, all of La Squadra Esecuzione, is here. Uh, like every shot, we see a different angle of this big living room they're tossing. I, I think it's Trisha's mom's place, I mm-hmm. guess. Yeah. Uh, so I, I won't list them. Just know everyone's here. Risotto's the last one to, to be seen. They're not in order the order in which they die. That would have been a fun choice. Yeah. They might talk in that order, at least those of which that talk, but that's not the order in which they're shown. Yeah. So as soon as Trish's mom dies and Trish starts becoming a hot potato among the capos, these guys jumped into action to toss this house to try to find uh, uh, clues to clues to the boss, clues to where Trish is, because she's the biggest clue to the boss, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They don't find anything. They do find this picture that all of the recent action is about, but they don't know what they have and don't treat it as anything. <laughs> yeah. Like going out of the fl- the the flashback, Risotto is kind of re- reflecting on that briefly. On you know how they've all died in in the name of this mission, he's going to be the one to finish it and all this. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And this is when Dopio, you know, you know, still piecing together the the powers of Risotto's stand and stuff. Uh, he's figured out how he's making himself invisible because this stand yes. also has like it's basically magnetic. Yeah, yeah, he's magnetized iron dust in the environment in such a way that it is active camo. Yeah. Th- there is like a dot, dot, dot in there that never gets filled in to my satisfaction. <laughs> yeah. It just happens. Mm-hmm. And there's a later example It's that you don't even need the stand to make it happen. It just happens. Mm-hmm. Uh, around this point is also when Risotto says, quote, he who cannot control his emotions dies first. I've seen how people die in this fight. That's irrelevant. <laughs> yeah. Like, I, I believe it is something Risotto believes. It's how he comports himself. But if that, but but if proving that true or false is like the theme, is the moral of this fight, it's not. It's nope. just not. <laughs> nope. And this is when he goes invisible again. And there's like a, we get another shot of Dopio seeing the future through his hair. And the animation 
on it's this. It's so fucking rad. Yeah. <laughs> the, the epitaph itself, the, the face on his face has not been there for a while, but he just like flips his head around, does a, a, a flex, and then it appears like yeah. he, it's the first step of his magical girl transformation. Yes. There's even <laughs> like a, a, a pink sparkly that shoots out of his forehead towards the camera. Amazing. Yeah. It really like, does look like the very beginning of a, a tr- magical girl transformation. There, there are elements of the fight in this episode, and this one might be chief among them. This or, yeah, the uh, um, scissors toss earlier that uh, are animated with the fidelity of the OP for an action show. Yeah. And yeah. not like the, the moment to moment blow by blow of an action show. Yeah. It just looks really good. But yeah, his foresight is showing him that there's like three dozen razor blades flying at him. Or not yeah, razor blades, yeah. uh, surgical uh, like scalpels. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. He sees Risotto is about to do the, the Dio knife attack. And so he does the only defense we know against the Dio knife attack. <laughs> uh, he gets his big burly stand arms to punch away some of them, but others get through. Mm-hmm. Ta-da! Ta-da! Hey, Giorno, check out your dad over here. Someone's pretending to be your dad. What do you think about that? <laughs> and so, yeah, he gets hit by a couple. He falls to the ground. He immediately gets an- another uh, gl- glimpse into the future where more of them are raining down from the sky when dopio uses king crimson's arms it sounds like a tommy gun fire it does. and i love it yeah it's a noticeably different sound than when they use like machine gun sounds for like star platinum <laughs> uh, but so yeah he's he's all he's able to do being on the ground is just try to roll out of the way of them and nope there's one that still gets stuck in his leg uh yeah. then he sees another vision and uh it's dozens of needles erupting out of his face Yep, and yep. then it happens! Yay! Uh... So now the boss is upset, because you know what? <laughs> <laughs> if you're in a carpool, and the driver slams the, the car into a median, mm-hmm. that's sort of what the boss is feeling right now. <laughs> yeah. Quote, I will not allow you to take more damage. <laughs> <laughs> Your HP is getting far too low, Topio. <laughs> this whole time... Uh, Risotto is just sitting on a rock watching this happen, still invisible. And this is when he starts talking about like, hey, do you know what happens when the human body kind of runs out of iron? Yeah, he is indulging Araki's explainer impulse. He is the voice through which we get explainer time. Yeah. Because he's not just telling us about what iron deficiency means. He's telling us about how important it is to eat green leafy vegetables (laughs) and certain other foods like liver. Mm hmm. Essentially, the the real takeaway that's like tactically important is that you know if I steal all the iron out of your body, that means I'm fucking up your hemoglobin. That means oxygen won't bind to your red blood cells, which means you are suffocating while still breathing. Yep. He's basically given Dopio super anemia over the course of this fight <laughs> yeah. by turning his blood into knives, <laughs> and we see this. <laughs> By Dopio's blood beginning to turn yellow, like not all at once. Yeah. You know, you know how if you've been eating like a burger or a hot dog for a while and the mustard and the, the ketchup mix, but don't mm-hmm. really blend fully. Yeah. They might have taken a picture of that and used it as the color layer on some of these shots because that's exactly what it looks like. Yep. His, his blood is slowly turning this like sickly yellow color. And this is when the boss pops up again in Dopio's head and says hey, don't do fucking anything else. I'm almost there. I'm going to finish this myself. And you can see like random muscles on Dopio's body like slowly twitching and like enlarging. But if you thought this was a two-way fight, that's where you are wrong, my friend. Mm-hmm. Because Aerosmith is buzzing around nearby. Yep. The the gang's at the beach just further, you know, down down the cliff. The, the gang is scouting out for enemies. So Aerosmith is out and about. Uh, and so now it's also very important for the two guys in this fight to finish this super quickly before either of them can get caught. And also the the boss and Dopio are very upset because they are down on the beach at the photo spot. Mm-hmm. They've reached to the place that Dopio was supposed to be defending with his life. <laughs> yeah. Somehow they got there without actually getting Trisha's picture that she looked at every day of her life. Perhaps she just remembered the picture she looked at every day of her life. <laughs> mm-hmm. Dopio wants to, he thinks he has a way to find Risotto again. And that is, mm-hmm, if mm-hmm. Risotto's power, you know, ha- has magnetism uh, as part of it, he grabs one of the um, 
surgical blades and just like balances it on his finger to see which way it'll point and goes, okay, yeah, well, if it's yeah. getting pulled in that direction, that's where he is. I do love this moment because it starts with essentially one last vision through Epitaph, which is Dopio getting fucking destroyed and a giant chunk of his skull missing. <laughs> yes, his head, a quarter of his head is just gone. So the boss is like, hey, bud, you did good, but you, you pitched some strong innings, but it, it's time to hit the bench. And he's like, no, I still got the heat. Let's go. Yep. <laughs> so he does his, his yeah compass needle trick. Uh, it's so good. It's so good. He's got like three more of the blades that rain down from earlier, like in between his fingers, like Wolverine claws. And then when he sees the other blade point in a certain direction, he throws all of them that way, thinking, you know, he's going to get him with these blades. But Risotto saw that coming oh, just shit. through like tactical thinking. He doesn't have a magic forehead face. <laughs> So what really drew the, that uh, uh, scalpel with its magnetic force was the severed foot that he left behind just yes. for such a trap. <laughs> yeah, he t he popped his foot back off. There's some good like fighting game mechanics there with Risotto, <laughs> with like magnetism and like willingly popping your foot off and leaving it somewhere on the somewhere else in the stage for that to be the point of magnetism. I don't know. That sounds like you do something mm -hmm. fun with that. So so this is where the, the dub script writer just like fist pumped and then ran around the block before <laughs> cashing their way too small uh, uh, for what they deserve check. Mm -hmm. Risotto says, quote, I did a lot of soul searching after I was separated from my foot. <laughs> love it. I yeah, love it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I wrote that down. S-O-L-E. I got you. I see what you did. <laughs> And what he's been searching through his soul about is, um, you know, did you know that Risotto is not only a world-class assassin, he's also able to uh, diagnose psychological disorders? Yes! Yep, I forgot about this part. So so we've been talking about Dopio and the boss as a Jekyll Hyde, but uh, now they, they are not only bringing in, like, one of the big fictional examples before there even was a diagnosis, but the actual term multiple personality disorder mm -hmm. into the discourse. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we have taken the tarp down off of the elephant in the room here. Uh, <laughs> yeah. He, he also says that it is an idea that originated with 16th century German philosophers. And I did a little wiki diving today and I still don't know what the fuck he's talking about. <laughs> yeah. I was wondering what he, he meant by that. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Hmm. It's just one of those alternate history things, I guess. I don't it, know. It, it was the 90s. We were actually in the middle of a boom of research and popular interest into mm. uh, MPD or DID. I think the, the term switch was happening right around now, I think. I, I'm not going to talk like I know what the fuck I'm saying, but I will say... Man, it, it sure does kind of suck that the only time we see any sort of neurodivergence in this show, it's, and they're all serial killers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, come, come on, man. Come on, man. Mm -hmm. The only counterexamples are headcanon. <laughs> yep. As with so many things, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I want to think about these two as, like... Uh, Jekyll and Hyde, but it's instead saying, hey, you remember that movie Split? <laughs> like, yeah. That movie Split was pretty fun to, to watch, not fun to think about in any sort of its implications mm -hmm, uh, uh, mm -hmm. or, or metaphors or anything. Oh, Good God. looking, though. I'll give you that. I, I haven't actually seen Split. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, and also while all of this is happening, a razor blade is emerging out from behind, <laughs> yeah. from Dopio's eyebrow as if he had a razor blade tucked under, like, beneath like behind his eyeball mm -hmm, that part's real around, bad around the like brow line temple region mm -hmm. yeah 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 <sighs> so, <laughs> so he is taunted by risotto asking what face will you have after you die which is a baller last line though it is it is but <sighs> but this fight ends when somebody somebody forgot he wasn't alone <laughs> mm-hmm because as Risotto is stepping forward slowly to deliver, you know, the killing blow to this man who is just a mess of bicolored blood, who, who's gasping for breath that will not, you know, bind to, to his cells, ready, ready to lay down the coup de grace. Instead, there is machine gun fire and he's mm -hmm. fucking dead. <laughs> <laughs> yup. He gets shot 
like a dozen times in the back by Aerosmith. And and but that's not all. The boss is awake, motherfucker. <laughs> yep, the boss is here now. So those scalpels that Dopio threw mm-hmm. sailed off the cliff and landed near the gang on the beach, and they went, "What the fuck? There's an enemy here!" And as Aeros, Dopio did JoJo's trick. Dopio yeah, did JoJo's trick. This is a pretty good JoJo's trick. I like this. You know, so Aerosmith started searching for enemies and only one person risotto showed up on the radar because it searches you know for for breath and and all that stuff and uh guess who ain't breathing at all because they have no iron in their body (laughs) since his super anemia is preventing respiration he's he's does not show up on the on the boop boop swoops radar Mm -hmm. and so and so Risotto is blown apart. Big meaty chunks fly off of him, one of which hits the boss in the head, carrying the active camo with it yes. and fulfilling the prophecy of a missing chunk. Not a missing chunk. It turns out all along it was an invisible chunk yep. of his head. <laughs> yep. And that's the end of the episode. What a fun... The- the sheer power and force and turnabouts that you can cram into a one episode fight. Right. One and a half. Fine. I'll give sure, you that. Sure. But still, but still though. Mm-hmm. Episodio Ventoto, beneath a sky on the verge of falling. How poetic. Yeah. So yeah, we get a recap of the end moments of that fight. Luigi wins by doing absolutely nothing. <laughs> so let's Okay, sorry. Go ahead. Am I wrong? <laughs> no, that's why it's so funny. <laughs> so let's check the scorecard here on the execution squad. Naraja killed two. Yeah. The boss killed two himself. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, way back in flashback times. Two for Bruno, three for Giorno. Okay. Nar- narrow, narrow win for Giorno. Yeah. I mean, it, and if you want to put in a, a Squalo and Tiziano... Mm-hmm. If if you add them as like honorary members for like cutting in line before risotto, then then Narancia goes straight to the head of the pack. Yeah, damn. I mean, when you think about it, his stand is probably like it's a small plane that shoots fucking infinite bullets. <laughs> like even and it has me- fire bombs. Yeah, the fire bombs have never killed anybody, but they they're fun. Yeah, even like Mises got you know limited ammo. He has a very big hat. That's it, not true. It, it, that's true. <laughs> So, yeah, after that that recap here, the gang on the beach and and Narancha just saying, hey, I got something. <laughs> I just shot someone <laughs> to death. So, yeah, they're down on the beach. They know about the photo. They have uh, uh, correctly guessed that the photographer is the boss way back when, all those years ago. And Bruno is in a hurry to get this fucking done while Abakio is pretty uneasy. <laughs> mm-hmm. Because Abakio is saying, like, okay... Even if this dude's dead, we literally just stopped fighting a guy who was stronger when he was dead. So... <laughs> I do not feel comfortable being the sitting duck here right now. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the the three of them here on the beach are trying to figure out, like, do we go up and look at the body and poke it with the stick to make sure it's really dead? Because, <laughs> like, it might not be. The, the rest of the gang are in the turtle. And so for this to work... Bakio is going to immediately start on rewinding time with mm-hmm. uh, with his stand because it takes a long time to go back fifteen years yep. when you don't even know which date of fifteen years ago you're aiming for. So he's got to like go really really fast and then scrub through the year. <laughs> yeah, and I love the part where it's like Bruno is asking Abakio how long it's going to take, and he says, you know, like almost two decades is going to take like. It like eight to twelve minutes or something like that, and then Bruno just says, "You'll get it done in five. It's not how my stand works. He watched a lot of Star Trek. It's fine. Just <laughs> just let him have this. Yeah. So yeah, Bruno and uh, Narancha are gonna go check on this this dead guy, uh, this this dead guy's body. While Narancha sends a, a little bomber to go talk to the turtle yep. to summon the other three to become Abakio's bodyguards. Yep. How far away is the turtle? too far (laughs) Uh so back up on the cliff we've got the boss talking to a barely alive risotto who is slowly bleeding out to death with about three million bullet holes in his body and he he offers a deal like hey i will give you a swift and honorable death because you don't want bruno and his people to kill you those guys come on let me handle this as long as you give me my iron back 
<laughs> yes, he desperately needs iron. And he's he's really trying to sway Risotto with the, the talk of like, hey, don't disgrace all of your dead buddies. You know, don't go out to the, the enemy like this. You fought with honor and all. Like, he's really trying to butter him up so he can get his fucking iron back. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, and Risotto starts mumbling something. The boss can't quite hear him. So he leans in to hear what he's saying. And this is when Risotto grabs him pulls the boss's body uh, like in front of his as Aerosmith comes in for an extra volley of bullets. Yeah. And his last words are, I'm not dying alone, which like Risotto has only really been a character for what this, this one fight essentially, Mm. but okay. He also tortured an IT guy. Fine. (laughs) Yeah. But he's got some baller lines. That's a good, good line. Yeah. He's great. So yeah, Aerosmith just starts firing almost point blank at, the boss in risotto because it's been hijacked <laughs> yes that's right <laughs> all the little metallica blobbies have swarmed little bomber and i don't know taken over mr smith the legendary <laughs> mr smith pilot yep and now he is in control of naranja stand and using it to to fire into the boss's back mm-hmm. except he does not successfully fire into the boss's back <laughs> Yep, he he uses uh, King Crimson's powers to just uh, have the bullets pass right by him for the the half second the bullets would be passing through him, and Risotto gets riddled with even more bullets. He just obliterated that time, that that little blink of time. Then the boss, who is still you know basically not breathing, goes, "Oh shit, those guys are coming now!" And all he can do is slowly crawl away <laughs> to quote replenish my stolen nutrients. <laughs> My nutrients. I hate when they talk about nutrients. I hated it before. I hate yes, it again. Yes, this, this is a, it's the second time now. So Bruno and Abacchio arrive. Nope. Abacchio's downstairs. Uh, so Bruno and Arancha arrive at the scene of the crime, I guess, mm-hmm. and start doing things that, well, Abacchio would do. Uh, uh, and Bruno asserts that some third party killed Risotto, that... Uh, 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 Narancha does not get to chalk this up in his win column. Guess what? I am. I make the <laughs> rules. Mm-hmm. It's Bruno looking at the severed foot and going like, I don't think a bullet severed that foot clean like that. As we all know, Little Bomber's uh, rounds are, are super heated. We've seen them cauterize wounds before. <laughs> yeah. And, and there's no no burn damage on the ankle here. Mm-hmm. So yeah, there there is some third party in the mix here, cutting foots off and whatnot. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the boss is, you know just feet away from them crawling away hide like hidden by rocks uh like cursing them for for being here and, and he this is when he reveals that he's got like an attachment to sardinia too because his birthplace like he doesn't want these mm-hmm, people mm-hmm. to like defile his birthplace or whatever he's got an attachment to everything that is him he, he yeah. is so like self-aggrandizing and self-centered that yeah Sardinia, they don't deserve Sardinia. Sardinia is mm-hmm. a me place, not a them place. Yeah. And so Bruno begins ordering Narancha to start searching on his radar for whoever, wherever the third party could be. But there's like lots of tourists around on the beach and mm-hmm. like cars on the, the highway near them and all this. So and lots of animals. And so like if you adjust the search range, which apparently Narancha can do. Yeah, he, he's essentially caught in the trade-off between, like, accuracy and clarity. Yeah. If if he makes it super sensitive, he'll be picking up, like, rats and, and such. And if he makes it super wide, it's all those people down on the beach. And Bruno's like, hey, just look at the fucking dots. Yep. Look at the dot that looks like someone running away from a fight they barely survived. <laughs> And then here's a part I completely forgot about until rewatching this. The boss desperately needs nutrients. And so yeah. <laughs> so he eats a phone? That's so <laughs> gross. What are you eating telephones for? Yeah, the n- nature's phone, the frog. Uh, <laughs> uh yeah, there's just a big old frog just hopping around and so yeah, he grabs it and just snake eater style just starts chomping down in that live frog. A lot chewier than I would have expected a phone to be. <laughs> yeah. And right around now, as the boss is, is feasting on, on phone, this is when Mista and Giorno have gotten out of the turtle and they're getting closer to Abakio. Uh, mm-hmm. Trish is with them, still in the turtle, which Mista is holding. She's wearing heels. It's fine. Yeah. Uh, she, she'll come out when she's needed, which is to say, not in any episode we're talking about today. Damn it. Uh, she she got a stand. She's on the team. She just come got on. a stand. Let her do stuff. 
So yeah, they're they're rushing towards Abakio, but they're still pretty far away. And uh, Abakio, you know, just sitting there, rewinding the stand, his stand still. There's soccer children frolicking about and getting closer to him, and that's that's annoying him. He needs to focus. Well, of course he hates kids. <laughs> <laughs> He's Abakio. He hates kids. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think we needed to be told that before to assume Abakio hates kids. Yeah. Uh, meanwhile, Narancha does pick up a dot that just clearly is going away from them in a straight line. And so mm-hmm, they, they mm-hmm. chase that down. It's behind a rock. Bruno gives whoever's behind that rock, because they see some some feet like pulling behind the rock, gives them three seconds to come out. And if not, they're dead. So, of course, they, they don't come out. So he zipper punches the giant boulder in half and finds... A terrified child with his mouth sewn shut by shoelaces. Yes. And a big trail of blood leading away. Yep. So yeah, Bruno and Narancha are just like, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> Somebody and- has been vampire feeding on this small boy, mm-hmm. and it's very confusing. They don't immediately identify that's what it is, but come on, that's what it is. Yep. And you know what Bruno does here? You know what he does? He uses hand signals. Yes. They've had hand signals. They do have hand signals. Maybe they just, I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> On the ride from, from the sky in the, yes. the plane canopy, they had time to develop brand new hand signals for such an event. <laughs> but yeah, as they're just kind of sitting there seeing this child bleeding to death and not knowing what is happening... This is when the, the group of soccer children get closer to Abakio than they... One of them accidentally kicks a ball into a tree branch they can't reach. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so Abakio, annoyed about this, but, you know, just wants them to leave. He grabs that ball, gives it back to him, you know, thanks, mister. They all leave. And as the final child runs by Abakio, Abakio gets a, a King Crimson arm clean through his whole, his whole being. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, he has a new hole in his being. Yes. Yep. He gets he gets the tummy hole again. Uh, uh, it's it's his favorite move. Oh, he's he's dead. He's fucking dead. He's yep. actually straight up instantly dead. Fuck you, Jorno and Mista. Where were you? He's dead. Yep. Moody Blues title card. Not Moody gonna Blues. be seeing you again. <laughs> nope. The child that was bleeding was one of the soccer kids. And the boss stole his blood. Boss stole his blood and his, and his, and clothes. his clothes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> So back in the action, uh, mm-hmm. Abakio is having a meal in a colorless outdoor cafe. Is this heaven? Is God colorblind? It makes you think. Hmm. And underneath uh, uh, the next table over is a cop who is looking for a particular shard of glass from a particular broken bottle used in a fight for fingerprinting. And Abakio is like, that's dumb as hell. <laughs> You are never going to find that. That is impossible. Mm -hmm. Stop touching all of the broken glass. (laughs) Even if you find it, even if you find it, what, what, you think that just like finding a guy's fingerprint is going to lead to a conviction and going to jail? Haven't you heard of defense lawyers? They exist and I hate all of them forever. (laughs) And, and this, this cop, he, he starts talking about how, you know, okay, sure. Even if this guy gets away there's always basically there's always next time justice always gets served in the end and abakio Mm -hmm. listening to this like mouth agape and he just just says like i have no idea how you have the resolve to believe in that he's shocked he's absolutely shocked at the idea that a, a police officer a member of a brotherhood to once he to which he once belonged could believe that truth and not convictions is true justice. <laughs> yeah. And then this cop starts talking to Abakio by name, sounding very familiar uh, and, and mm-hmm. saying, you know, Abakio, you know, you, you have done good in your life. You know, the extortion, the gambling racket, the loan uh-huh. sharking, the arson, the mayhem, the armed <laughs> robberies, the homicides. You've done so much good. You never once sold drugs to kids. And that's what really matters. Yay. I'm so proud of you, my friend. And this is when it's it becomes very clear that the, the cop talking to Abakio here is his partner that he accidentally got killed all those years ago. When Abakio realizes this, this is when all the color in the world floods back in. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. 
And there's also like a bus on the other side of the road where Abakus is like, I got to go. I got to go help my friends. I got to get in this bus. And this is when the his, his partner tells him like, you came here in that bus and you can't like go back on it. You're fucking dead, dude. I can't wait to see what are the other four people he will meet in heaven, Mitch Album style. <laughs> yeah. But but yeah, back in the land of the living, the, the rest of the boys, you know, round up around the body with a big round hole. And uh, of course... Of course, they. it's time for big manly feelings of strong manly grief. Yep. And Narancia is locked in, in the stage of denial, demanding Jorno do something, quote, before I kick your ass. <laughs> yes. Yeah, Jor- Jorno just puts his hand on Abakio or, or near it, and, you know, no life energy. Abakio was just instantly dead when that he got mm-hmm, punched. Mm-hmm. Bruno is continuing to blame himself for all setbacks, as always, mm-hmm. just like on the plane. Bruno begins walking away like we we had we all have to get out of here it's way too fucking dangerous you know this is my error that I made and as Bruno's walking away you know he gets some of that man pain close ups where he he's doing everything he can to be to to maintain composure and not shed tears and he's butting his lips so hard it's bleeding and that's never going to bleed in his current state as a dead man he's a he's a zombie I'm telling you <laughs> But it's especially hard for him because the crew isn't listening. They aren't, well, specifically Narancia. Mm-hmm. You're supposed to be bottling your emotions. Be a real man. Yeah. Be an emotionally stunted man. Instead of screaming at me that this is not the way to, to honor our brother. Yeah. And so, yeah, Narancia is actually letting all these emotions out and, and crying. Like, he he tried to go after Bruno, falls over and on the ground, just, like, pounding the ground, crying, uh, just bawling. Right before Narancia fell over, he was like flailing around and accidentally knocked Jorno over. And Jorno falls onto Abakio's uh, body, which pushes him, sh- shoves him to the side just enough where they notice something. And that's uh, Abakio's holding a little stone in his hand. Yeah, he's holding like a little shard of some sort of stone. And they're like, what is, what is, what is this? What is this? And Jorno says, oh yeah, I, I can find out. Let me touch it and turn it into a bug. And then tell that bug to go back where it came from, where it will turn back into a stone. And that shard is a little sliver of this stone monument where, like, the, the picture was taken. Mm-hmm. That, that, that's what Trisha's mom was, like, leaning by around this whole site of the action. I don't know what it's a monument to. Who cares? Mm-hmm. Uh, the show certainly doesn't. Now, now they notice there's a giant hunk of monument missing mm-hmm. in the shape of a human face. Yes. So at some point, at some point, (laughs) Moody Blues finished its scrub of that year, found the face it was looking for, and then slammed its head and hands because they're about to get fucking fingerprints off of this rock. Yes. So hard that it created a negative relief. And, like, they will shortly pour, like, plaster in it to Mm -hmm. take a molding, to take a casting of it. (laughs) <laughs> yep. To make a, a, a boss bust <laughs> that has fingerprints. It has fingerprints. It has fingerprints. <laughs> why, why don't we see that? I want to see a flashback of Moody Blues just decimating itself. Yeah. Because like the last time we do see Moody Blues, it's just on the ground and it's, you know, just it has cracks all over it. And it's basically just disintegrating. Mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. Yes, they got a boss bust. And and as they they walk away, there there's, you know, the ghosts of our, our two cops in the clouds. Twice, two different uh, uh, versions of cops in clouds. Yep. We we get a Bakio with his partner and then at the very end of the episode, we we get the the golden sky and and the beautiful clouds, which this time are kind of forming a bed that a sleepy smiling Abakio is resting on. <laughs> Rest in peace Abakio. So, Episodio 29, get to the Roman Colosseum. I wonder what the new mission is. Hmm. So, uh, Narancia and Mista are, are starting off by running off a hill. Mista has Coco Jumbo cradled in his arm like he's going for the Heisman. Good for him. <laughs> and the other three are inside Mr. President, while Giorno is looking for the boss's face and fingerprints in all of the databases. <laughs> yes, they, 
they've got ad- access to like all the different criminal databases uh, searching for the boss. We're still in like originally written 1998 times. So this is before CSI. Yep. Uh, again, I want to say that like JoJo's Bizarre Adventure certainly did not invent like going through criminal databases that have faces that go blah, 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 mm-hmm. no match, you know. But I feel like it's definitely early ways before it was literally oh, yeah. everywhere, right? And like depending where you were in the world, and even like the states, like in the late '90s, which places had the ability to do that was still kind of like hit and miss, if I remember correctly. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But I mean, I'm talking about media. Every yeah, cop media. can do that now. Yeah. <laughs> Ever, I've, I want to pin it on CSI again. I'm, I, it's got to be what popular. I, I didn't it, really right? check my references on that, but that's that's really a gut call. But it feels right, you know. Yeah. Yeah, they're they're searching on this laptop and they're getting no results in like any database bases, including death records to see if like he faked his own death. Mm -hmm. Uh, This is when we get our one Trish scene of the week. Oh, man, only one. And she's just feeling her mystic blood bond uh, with the boss while she holds the bust and just like twists it in her frustration. <laughs> yes, she's, she's, <laughs> she's spice girlsing it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> just rubberizing it. That's that's good. That that is a good like it's, illustration yeah. of mood to just like oh, yeah, duh, 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 duh. I'm gonna turn your fucking plaster cast into a fidget toy. I'm so upset with you. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And yeah, everyone's pretty on edge. Because they just got this thing that, you know, Abaka had to fucking die for, and it's not leading anywhere. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, un- uh, <laughs> until. Until. Until special guest teammate, the super hacker, joins. Yes, their laptop gets hacked. <laughs> and By like, an orb. An orb with a bow tie. So all of their, all the, like, wind, like, they just hear a voice coming from their laptop. Uh, just coming out of nowhere, just like, actually, your search has come to an end. And like all a voice, I, I don't want to reveal anything until our next recording, yep. but a voice that gets progressively more recognizable as the episode yes. goes on. Yes, yes, <laughs> can't wait. Um, <laughs> but it starts off like, oh, new guy. And then he gets like, oh, they're reusing that guy for a new character. And then by the end, like, Oh, I know this guy. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> Hell yeah, man. Uh, but yeah, like, all the, like, windows on their desktop, like, just start floating and they get sucked into, like, a hacker wormhole. <laughs> 1998, baby! <laughs> but, but yeah, the big announcement is, like, don't, don't even sweat it. You already found the boss. Now you just need to figure out how to destroy him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. He also drops in conversation that the boss's name is Diavolo. <laughs> yes. I guess the super hacker is Morgan, our guest from last week. Uh, identity <laughs> revealed. Yep. But but yeah, the, our, our hacker friend has just been waiting for someone with the drive and skills to even get this far before he would reveal himself and just dangle the promise of these tantalizing secrets before them. Mm-hmm. Immediately saying, like, I am, I'm on your side, bros. I am the cool hacker man. And everyone's Please just like... Please do not hang up on me. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Bruno just tells Jarno, just like, turn the computer off. And that guy's just like, no, <laughs> I'm hacking. Come on. Of all the people to be the super hacker, you'd never expect it. Right? Yeah. It kicks ass. <laughs> I cannot wait for the reveal. So he drops some more tidbits like, hey, 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 let, let me prove it. The boss's stand, Diavolo's stand, works by with time and they're like whoa and trish has some deductive reasoning here like okay if this guy was like uh, lying to us then he'd be a minion of the boss and there's no way there's no way my father would allow one of his minions to know that about his stand Mm -hmm. he must be telling the truth (laughs) yeah she's like doing sudoku with clues it's like just eliminating this weird chain of if this then then to be like ah, this guy's probably all right yeah 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 and so the the hacker guy is saying King Crimson is basically invincible, basically, but I have knowledge of a way to defeat it. And I cannot tell you. <laughs> I cannot tell you over hacker channels. You have to come physically meet me in Rome. And one of the things, one of the other, like, uh, uh, you know, carrots on the end of the stick is he's got a stand arrow, but his is special because it has a bug on it. <laughs> yeah. This is the special, like, three-lobed stand arrowhead that we've seen in in this second OP for a few episodes now. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, the third lobe 
is kind of like a grasshopper type thing with a big tail. Yeah, or yeah, it's kind of grasshoppery, I guess. In my in my head, I kept thinking it was like a scarab, but it's not really not really a scarab. Yeah, I don't know. So yeah, Bruno and Giorno are both like, "Oh shit, there's more than one of those things." And uh, the the hacker guy is saying, "You have to come." Yes, <laughs> yes. There's like a million of them. Yes, and also two, you have to come visit, come meet me, so I can give you this arrow. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. This is a special arrow, and not even Diavolo knows the true power of this stand giving arrow. It bears a hidden wisdom and the key to his defeat. He's just like really, really trying to rope these guys in for some manner of con job, I have to think. <laughs> Meanwhile, on the outside of the turtle, Mista leaps 70 feet into a speedboat. Hell yeah. And meanwhile, on the beach, Dopio is uh, making telephone ringing noises, looking for the phone. He's like, where the fuck is his phone? And he finds some ladies who stole his phone? And it looks Weird. like one of them is going to eat his phone? Hey. That's so rude. <laughs> this is a double scoop of phone. Ooh. <laughs> yes. So he grabs this very cold uh, waffle cone phone, <laughs> gets his face all sticky with it. Yep. Oh, man. And so, yeah, he answered the phone, and the boss on the other end is saying, hey, they just got in that boat, and they're heading somewhere really fast with purpose go back to where abakio was because something feels really off they they must have got a clue if they have a plan that they're acting on like this i i don't know you got to check it out so so dopio does check back at the monument but it's been smashed to bits they covered that bit of their tracks Mm -hmm. and the boss is like all right I hate to do it, because these guys suck so much. I hate, oh god damn, I hate these two guys. But you gotta call up Chocolata and Seko. They're yes. very nasty boys. I despise <laughs> them. We don't know for sure if those guys found anything, but gotta make sure, get the grossest, nastiest guys I got in reserve. And you, you do get a brief glimpse at them like superimposed over the sky and they look pretty nasty they're 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 pretty nasty boys they're gross guys uh so yeah the phone is just like melting all over dopio's face getting real sticky Mm -hmm. uh and back in the turtle a hacker man just wants to give a some fun geography trivia uh (laughs) including film reel effects Yeah, yeah okay get ready for some really insane lore behind stands that Completely is- unnecessary <laughs> lore behind Stan. If this goes on to have a purpose, I will be so upset. Yeah. Hacker Man it, it begins talking about the origin of the Stan giving arrows. He doesn't even reveal that's what it's about. Like, that's the ending yeah, twist, yeah. is that that's what this story st- uh, uh, is leading to. It starts with, hey, y'all ever heard of Greenland? Yep. There's this spot on <laughs> Greenland uh, uh, where, where a meteorite once hit and oh boy the the local inuit tribes they loved this meteorite but then in the 70s the survey team came to check it out and they all died with horrible boils all over their bodies <laughs> yep except this one guy who got rad superpowers and also boils all over his body <laughs> yeah and you can see just like as these images in this film reel are are flying by you just see, like, a dude on an operating table covered in hideous boils just shooting, like, force lightning out of his fingertip and severing a surgeon's finger clean off his hand. So when they studied the chunks of this meteorite, they found that in its path through the cosmos that landed in Cape York on the uh, the west coast of Greenland, it picked up an alien virus. <laughs> yes. An alien virus. And, and this is the source of stands it's a highly deadly alien contagion that if you get it you are almost certainly to die unless through its own twisted version of natural selection you are the strong that survives Mm -hmm. and you get stand powers from it yep and hundreds of years ago we're not told exactly when or why except Mm -hmm. that uh some dude wanted to gain the power of god some ancient guy made a bunch of arrows out, out of this stuff, out of this this meteorite. And that's where all the stand arrows came from. Mm-hmm. Does that include the one inside the mouth of Black Sabbath? Who could say? Who could I'm say? not going to say. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. It's so like out of left field when I was watching this first time and just learning that stands the byproduct of an alien virus. <laughs> 
So, so I don't know if the specific expedition mentioned in that story is real, but mm-hmm. there is a Cape York meteorite. In fact, there are three. It, mm. it broke up into three pieces on impact. And the Inuit people did use it historically as a source huh. of iron for cold-forged arrowheads. Oh, okay. All right. Which have been found far, far away because meteoric iron uh, uh, has like a signature. You can trace these arrowheads to their source no matter how Mm. far away you find them and so it it is like evidence of deep deep prehistoric trade networks oh because we have always lived in a world system that's cool you have to remember that the emperors of rome and the emperors of china exchanged gifts Mm -hmm. like the, the world has always been interconnected yeah but anyway, what doesn't kill you gives you stand powers. We, all, we always knew this. We already knew this. That's why I keep working out with my pull-up bar. I just hope it happens one day. <laughs> I'm getting there. And Mysterious Hacker Man is like, oh, but you already know all about what stands are in the end, don't you? And as he says this, there are silhouettes of all of the Stardust Crusaders mm-hmm. and their stands. And Iggy is second to last. Yes. Avdol comes after the dog. What the hell? Avdol was on the team before Jotaro. Damn. What the fuck? Was that one popping up in Death Order? Because, like... Uh, no, if, if, because the living people came first. Well, like, reverse. Because, like, reverse if Avdol order. pops up last, he was the first to actually truly die. And then it was Iggy. I have it right here. Let's see what happens. There is no order in which this makes sense. Yes, Kakiwin shows up after Iggy. <laughs> it's not joining order. It's not leaving order. It's not reverse of no. either of those. It's not alphabetical. <laughs> Abdul would be first again. Yeah. And so Bruno is just saying, okay, but what's the secret power of this arrow then? And the hacker man goes like, I'll tell you when you're in Rome. <laughs> Fucking... <laughs> I can't get there. believe Araki invented midichlorians. Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but Bruno declares, I shall trust you with speed lines and whooshing. <laughs> His trust is so strong. Do you ever wish you could have that happen when you declared things? <laughs> I do. I'm going to get a drink. Whoosh. <laughs> I have to poop really bad. Whoosh. <laughs> <laughs> now that's JoJo's. Yeah, yeah. Uh... So, so yeah, they set a rendezvous at the Coliseum, as the episode title would imply. Mm -hmm. First, you know, they have to make a landfall from Sardinia to what what turns out to just be some coastal fishing village, where the idea is to, like, get a rental car and then drive inland to Rome. Yeah. They're being hunted. They know it. Mafia boys on the run. So they scope out the place and see two very drunk men who have to pee. And they're arguing about which public fixture to soil. (laughs) Yeah. One of them goes for a public mailbox. Mm -hmm. Just as a urinal. Hooray. Open that sucker up. And his friend is clinging all fours to this this post, this this pillar Mm -hmm. that is at the base of, you know, the staircase that goes from water's edge up to upper street level. So, so Bruno is giving Mista instructions from inside the turtle, which means Mista is gigantic, looming above yes. like Godzilla. I love, I, I love whenever they do this. Mm-hmm. And, and he's spotting even more drunks just laying around this this square. Uh, and, and so mailbox drunk picks up pillar clinging drunk in order to pull him away and be like, no, don't pee on that. We're going to go pee somewhere else. And his, his torso and one of his arms comes with, but his three limbs and pelvis stay behind. Yep, still clinging to the post. And this presents a problem, <laughs> as summed up by the bisected man when he says, quote, I can't reach my pee-pee now. <laughs> yep. As he is looking down at half the, you know, the half of his body that is missing and where his body popped off, there is now green goo. I hate it when I get green goo. So for some reason, Mailbox Man vaults over him. Yes. I guess in shock. In terror. I, I would probably jump. I don't know. And as he falls to to uh, uh, the ground below from being halfway up the staircase, his leg turns into a mass of algae. Yep. And then just totally crumples, unable to support his weight upon landing. Yep. This is enough for Mista to decide, ah, 
a stand attack. I must, <laughs> I must bend down and grab the gun from my boot. And when he does, there's goo on his hand. Yep. Uh, and this is when we see the two nasty boys spoken of earlier. The who, nastiest boys. Nasty, nasty. We get a good look at both of them. One of them is holding a video camera recording mm-hmm. all the mayhem that's going on. For pacing reasons, let's talk about one today and one next sure. week. Yeah. Because one of them does things and the other doesn't. <laughs> yeah, sure. So, so Chocolata, who's going to be doing things, has... Okay, you know how Risotto has a jester's hat with balls hanging off of it? Yeah. What if that was just hair? <laughs> Yep. What if your hair was in the style of jester hat with, with balls on the end of the, the dangly bops? Mm-hmm. Now this I want to see a hairstylist pull off. And it's all green. Yep. He is wearing a an interesting version of, of a of priest's frock, I guess. Yeah. And that it's a long coat with tails and a high collar and an embroidered cross over the chest. However, the the chest ends at his navel and so does the coat. It is a midriff Mm -hmm. bearing priest's vestments. (laughs) And the cross is in blue and has some like brocade going on. Like Mm -hmm. in the manga, it's supposed to be see-through. Like you're supposed to see chest behind it. But Mm. in the anime, they simplified it. It's just... A uh, black design on a solid blue uh, uh, cross. Yeah. Aside from that, it's a pretty normal outfit. <laughs> Aside yeah. from all those exceptions. He's also got like green face paint on, like on yes, his nose yes. and forehead and down his cheeks and uh, purple lipstick. Uh, his English voice played uh, Kusuke, the dad in Horamiya. Okay. Uh, and he was also Odin in Record of Ragnarok. Hmm. While the Japanese voice, if you want to see a movie, an American movie in Japan, you are going to be hearing this man's voice because he dubs for Mark Ruffalo, Christian Bale, Carl (laughs) Urban, and Tom Hardy. Oh my god. If you are hearing this man, you're having a good time, probably, especially if it's very corny. (laughs) Uh, If you are watching a corny, high-budget movie, you are hearing this man. Are any of those actors in the same movie together and does that they guy must be they must These are be five right? prolific men does that mean that guy gets double billing has to do both of them at, at least according to his wikipedia page he did not dub any of those five big names in the same movie but he did play two roles in riddick oh wow okay he was carl urban's character in riddick but also uh, uh santana originally played by Jordi mola in mm, riddick okay so there you go. All right. So yeah, the two nasty guys are just watching the mayhem as dudes get green goo on them and then like just fall to pieces, uh, videotaping it all. And we mm-hmm, get a, mm-hmm. a, a, a mid-episode title card that I'm not sure what it is because Netflix doesn't have subtitles for it. I think it might be explaining Dopio's abilities. Yeah, it is a, a sort of explanation of epitaph okay. and, and what it is to have half of a King Crimson, Prince Crimson. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and we, when we come back from the title card, uh, this is when we get uh, a new flashback so that we can learn a bit about Chocolata, who is 34 years old. Basically elderly in anime terms. Yep. And a former doctor fired for malpractice because he killed so many patients. <laughs> yep. And then uh, Passione said, ooh, look at this guy. We should probably <laughs> hire him. <laughs> And that's that's when he got his stand. Uh, see, the thing he would do to satisfy his sadistic urges would be to misdiagnose people so that they would be slated for surgery with him. And then he would skimp on the anesthesia so they could wake up during surgery and watch him slice them apart. Because <laughs> he's a cool dude. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like, okay, okay, even the boss doesn't like him. I get it. But this is just gruesome for gruesome's sake. You yeah, know? it's really over the top. It doesn't go to, like, Angelo places, but it's just so ridiculous. I can't take it even a JoJo degree of serious, you know? Yeah, it especially because even when he was a surgeon, he still had the jester like hair <laughs> and the makeup and stuff. Like, he still looks uh-huh. like a, he still looks like a clown, but like a clown doctor. Not a doctor for clowns, a clown that is a doctor. And it just comes <laughs> off like the origin story for a twisted metal character. Yes, yes. 
Like if you replace this with FMV footage of the exact same thing, like it would just be a, a twisted metal cutscene. There is a fine line between JoJo's flashback and Twisted Metal cutscene, but there is a line. There is normally a line, and we have crossed it. <laughs> uh-huh. But we're not done. No, no, we have to flash further back to when he, he was 14 years old, volunteering at nursing homes and convincing the residents to commit suicide. <laughs> By just whispering terrible lies to them about how their families never really loved them and are uh, just happy they're rotting away uh, alone and out of sight. Yes. And then he would videotape these things. Mm -hmm. Like... And collect them. He collected them. Yeah. And by the time he had killed nine people, he thought, and I now shall become a doctor. (laughs) I, I don't know. It's, it's probably because it was just drawn off model. No one, it didn't, doesn't matter at all. But the size of the cassette tapes on his shelves made it look like he filmed everything on beta tape, <laughs> 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 which is funny to me. Maybe he's got really big hands. Maybe, yeah. Quote, no activity brought him more ecstasy than observing death in action. Mm-hmm. Why don't you just watch JoJo's then? It happens all the time. Like every episode, basically. Nowadays, yeah. So we also get a bit of a sub uh, uh, origin story for Seco here, which is, of course, short for Prosecco. We have chocolate and, and wine. What a lovely day. Yum. Uh, uh, <laughs> and he is, you know, uh, uh, Chocolata's assistant. But they met when he was a patient who survived all of this. And <laughs> I would have to assume enjoyed it to some degree. Mm-hmm. Back to the present. Dopio is now on a plane, filling in the boss on an actual phone for once. He's Insane. holding a phone ha- receiver in his hand and, and telling the boss everything that's transpired, touching base, everything they need to know, and getting his fresh orders, which is to follow behind, and whoever survives this fight, kill them. Because, like, okay, hopefully Chocolata and Seko get the job done, but I'm sick of them. They're fucking <laughs> gross, and I don't want them in the mob anymore. Dopio, you have to, to clean up and kill them, too. Yep. <laughs> and I, I do like, while he's on the phone, he's seeing King Crimson out. Like, his reflection in the window in the plane is King Crimson instead, talking at him. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. And like, okay, sure, sure. The, what the boss actually says is, you know, if they, uh, uh, through the course of this fight, they might learn something from, from Bruno and his boys. No, we all know the real reason. He just doesn't like them. No, no. What is to like? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, this is the best punchline, perhaps, in all of Golden Wind. <laughs> mm-hmm. Uh, because the phone call ends and Dopio hands the phone back to the little girl he borrowed it from because it's not a real phone. It's like a little plastic Fisher Price play phone. <laughs> yeah. It's so good. It's really funny. And so she takes it and is like, hello? Is there, <laughs> is there really somebody here? <laughs> it's so good. Yeah. I love it. Oh, I love, oh, it's so good. It's I'm I'm glad Dopio's making friends too. He's so good with kids. He is. He would have figured out a way to return that soccer ball without dying. Mm-hmm. So now back back in the action with Misa and Narancha. Uh Narancha's just going, What the fuck is that goo in your hand? And Misa has <laughs> no idea what the goo is, other than it's bad and I don't like it. Narancha sends little bo- uh, Aerosmith up into the sky to scout it out, and everyone nearby is dead and covered in goo. And so he's, like, overwhelmed by the chaotic scene, even though, like, hey, just just think back. What's the last thing somebody told you about how to use your stand? Focus on the behavior of the dots. Are they currently dying? If so, ignore them. Mm-hmm. Misa's talking to Bruno in the turtle about what's happening, and he, you know, talking about the goo, and he's got, like... And how he's pretty sure it's oozing out from beneath his skin. Yeah. Another great one for me uh, today. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, there's so many. There's just a lot of stuff underneath the skin in part five, yeah, isn't there? There shouldn't be. There it's, should. It's, this, this is also why I think I don't like certain sea creatures. Mm. Like, if you look at an octopus from the right angle, you can see right the fuck inside that thing. Oh, and I yeah. Hate it. I it's, hate it so. It makes it's, my skin crawl. It's disgusting. Yeah. I don't like yes. it either. Especially when you start getting to like the deep sea stuff that's translucent. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Bad. My wife is trying to tell me that I'm wrong and that they're God's most perfect creature. <laughs> no, that's jellyfish, but they're like second. I don't like jellyfish either. <laughs> they're cool. 
<laughs> so everybody is is trying to figure out what to do. This is clearly a stand, but how does it work? How do we get around it? How do we protect ourselves from the, the goopening? And uh, Giorno pipes up to say, we shouldn't move until we figure out exactly what's attacking us. Yeah, but you always say that, though, every <laughs> time. Yep. You should just have a hand signal for that. Everyone would know. Mm-hmm. So Narancha is not taking that advice. Yeah, He's, no one's out at sea. Why don't we just find another place to land and park the boat? He hops right back into the boat and immediately explodes into geysers of mold. Yep. And now Mr. President is getting all moldy inside. Yep, and it's getting inside Mr. President, mm-hmm. too. And, and... I, I saw that on MSNBC. <laughs> uh, so Mista, Mista is the one who pieces it together here. Mm-hmm. This stand attacks by elevation. You can't go low. Yep. But it seems too late for it to matter. See, he figures this out when he reaches out for Narancia, and he's just got like a whole windmill arm motion, wide, wide arc as he, he reaches out and down in super slow motion. And as soon as his hand hits like level, level with like uh, uh, the ground, you know, straight out. Mm-hmm. And once it goes like one degree lower, there's algae mold goo on his hand. And that that's when he's like, ah, ah, I've got it. Mm-hmm. E- everyone's getting molded. And it's not just mm-hmm. mold growing mm-hmm. on people. It's just like high, like highly pressurized jets of mold are spewing out of their bodies. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Nasty. Uh, and this is when you can see Chocolata up on the top of the stairs, just scouting out what's happening thinking that every the gang might be figuring out how his stand Green Day works. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, we haven't done a lot of, like, talking about the bands being referenced, because, like, what is there to say about Metallica? Everybody knows what Metallica is. Yeah. What is there to say about Green Day? I have something to say about Green Day. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. I have... So much respect for uh, uh, musical acts that evolve and change over their lives continually or, or every few years. That's that's incredible. Everybody loves Prince. Everybody loves Bowie, right? Mm-hmm. I personally adore a band that says, fuck it. No, we are the thing that we were <laughs> and we always will be forever. I went to an Offspring show and they still sell bucket hats. All right. Oh I my respect God. the hell out of that. Wow. You know, you know what I hate? A band that changes once. Mm, yeah, that's that's what I think when I think about Green Day. <laughs> There's like pre-2003 and post-2003. You do it again. Do it again or shut up and go away. (laughs) Oh, man. Uh, So Green Day the Stand. Uh, Known as Green Tea in the localization. (laughs) Is kind of like a watermelon or weird cactus man wearing green armor. Okay, okay. Here's what I think of. I think, okay... Uh, a bank robber ski mask, but imagine if it didn't stop uh, at the neck. Imagine yeah. if it kept going all the way down to the toes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then you put some armor with a tummy window on top of that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Just totally encased in armor. So you only see that like pinstripe uh, or, or like cable knit texture on like, uh, you know, the bust, like clavicle up. Yeah. Uh, uh, torso below the pecs top of the thighs and feet everything else is this pale green like like a pale mint armor and he's got bright red glowing eyes coming out of his ski mask face yeah oh and also his fingers are the um the goof fingers yeah 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 yeah. the uh the the fingertips they just end in holes like they're gonna shoot Mm -hmm. bullets and he's also got little mist vents uh, all over his shoulder plates and in two rows of his noggin. <laughs> his, yep. Yeah, the very top of his head is very, like, cactus-like. Yeah. And yeah, it's just spewing out weird mold gas all over the place. And now, like, Giorno and Trish are having mold spewing out of their bodies. <laughs> Trish's thigh just bursts open? Yeah. That's gross. not good. I don't like that. And this is when Giorno looks at his moldy, gross hand and thinks, I once read about a type of mold that infects bugs. <laughs> no, you didn't. Fuck off. You did not. No, you did not. 
I think what he actually says is I I read about this mold or something like that. Not not like a mold that affects bugs, but a yeah. mold that does this. And no, you didn't. No, you didn't. Yep. Jorno's just like, hey, this is a mold that affects you only when you move downwards. Okay. Right. And he names it. He names it. So I looked it up. Uh-huh. Uh, uh, the mold is called Entomophaga grilli, and it is real. Okay. It is a real fungal parasite that affects grasshoppers. And it changes their behavior. What it does is it forces grasshoppers to climb up high and cling tight in, in its, like, last uh, uh, stage of, of the infection cycle. And then the grasshopper dies way up high, as high oh, as the grasshopper yeah, yeah. can go. Which then means that the spores, as they spore open, mm-hmm. uh, uh, will, will hit a wider patch of, of the, the ground below in which they will grow and, and get more grasshoppers. It gets grasshoppers when they're low and makes them go high. <laughs> Giorno has poor reading comprehension. <laughs> uh, uh, this also has been used as a natural pesticide if you've got a grasshopper problem, except it's uh, really bad at it. Mm, yeah. Because you also have to have like the proper growing conditions for this fungus, and there's a little bit of luck involved, even so. And huh. like, you know, we're we're trying, we're we're trying to to kill pests for for profit, but without poisoning the earth. Mm-hmm. What are you gonna do? But Jorno's like, okay, no, no, no. This makes perfect sense. This makes perfect sense that it kills this way because. All of the dead people are sporing zones, so by killing a lot of innocent bystanders, it's, it's artificially increasing the stand's range. Ah, yeah. Aha, aha, aha. This also goes back to, in the plane, the boss is like, that dude's going to kill all of Rome. Dopio, you have to stop him after he finishes killing my enemies. <laughs> and this is when uh, Narancha goes oh shit i'm completely covered in mold i gotta throw the turtle up and away from me so it doesn't get even moldier but he's so far gone he's so molded up that he can't throw the turtle very well in fact his fingers come off when he tries yes and so now the turtle is is flying and soon to fall and get super molded and this is mm-hmm. when mista goes what if i shoot the boat and make it explode <laughs> and propel all of us upwards yeah, yeah, so Sex Pistols redirect all, all of the shots into the gas tank. It explodes. Uh, uh, lift The shockwave lifts Narancha and Coco Jumbo up onto land. And that is when Bruno pops out of the turtle and, and like, takes charge of the situation. Mm-hmm. And Chocolata ends the episode by doing the smug anime man thing. <laughs> yes, interesting. Let's see how this plays out. <laughs> yeah. That thing anime villains really need to stop doing because... You're cartoonishly gross. I cannot take you seriously. Could you at least do something less generic while we're at it? Please, please. Yeah. That's that's it. That's the end of the episode. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was talking about this. I was talking about this with Elena earlier. As as I've mentioned before, I try to get some of these things in my head by explaining them to an audience (laughs) of one. (laughs) Yeah. And so the question she raised was, how does Green Day interact with erections? Uh. (laughs) I mean, for one, all three of them are fathers by now, so that's one answer. But no, after describing Mista's arm extension test that twigged it with him, she came up with the following theory. Mm -hmm. If one achieves an erection while uh, uh, in the range of the stand Green Day... (laughs) One must maintain it permanently or yes. else their dick will fall off. Yes, that, that is yes. exactly how that would work. <laughs> <laughs> Nine years married to this woman. God, it's uh, like some weird version of speed, but you're just constantly taking <laughs> dick pills so that you never lose your erection because otherwise it's going to fall off. At, at least until someone <laughs> just kills this horrible man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then And then his dying words are, you you had a boner while you watched me die. How does that make you feel? And then he's dead. And then you're safe. And then you're never going to forget that. That's yeah. just in your skin. That's under your fingernails, that thought. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, she, she also uh, thought that the Aero Meteor virus uh, was way more like the black oil from X-Files than midichlorians. And you know what? She's right. She's yeah. fucking right about that. Yes, yes. God, remember... <laughs> 
Remember how much the black oil was constantly shifting what it was and what it was doing throughout that show? I feel like they had six different ideas for what the black oil was was about. But one of the most constant things is it's almost certainly going to kill you, but a special few will get superpowers. Yes. God, it really is the... Okay, they get to Rome, they get the, the special stand arrow, and it just turns out that it's like the uh, the alien-killing stiletto from the X-Files, where it's just you stab mm-hmm, Diablo mm-hmm. in the back of the neck, and that kills him. There were a lot of Black Oil episodes that had aired before uh, uh, this was written. That's mm. all I'm going to say. All right, yeah. Krychek had already puked onto that rocket, yes! which I think is one of the coolest images in all of the X Files. Right, because the top was like it was like it had like it's a, a spiral, spiral thing, yeah, yeah. A spiral groove, and the oil was going down, yeah, into the center and in, sh- slooping into the the ship. That was cool. That was so fucking cool. <laughs> but anyway, thanks for joining us uh, yeah. talking about this show instead. Actually. <laughs> In our most, hey guys, I just read a magazine article set of episodes of all time. Yep. We are getting to Kojima levels of that <laughs> vibe. <laughs> oh, man. Bug fungus. And uh, did, did you know that they make arrowheads out of this meteor? Whoa. And Whoa. everything else. Mm-hmm. But hey, that, that fight with uh, Dopio and Risotto is really good. It's good. It's good. I mean, there's a lot of good stuff in here, but there's yeah. also a lot of like, wow. Wow, you can you can see it. You can see it. You can see, yeah, totally. Uh but yeah, next week we'll be back with uh three more episodes which is the, the localized version at least Green Tea and Sanctuary parts 1 through 3. Mhm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> There's three more episodes of this guy. I got to put up with this guy three more times. I'm with the boss on this one. Kill him. Kill yep. him faster. Get rid of this bad bad man. M- maybe he'll be interesting next time. I don't know. Yeah. I either want him interesting or dead. Well, he's going to be dead, at least. Oh, yeah. So I'll, I'll, I'll get my wish. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, until then, see you later. To be continued. Chocolata is Dick Cheney. Uh, uh. <laughs>